I'm a member of Congress from the 17th Congressional District in California, Central Coast of California. The date is June 8, uh, 2008. I'm in, uh, interviewing today Major General Bill Gorley. We are in the uh, Bill Gorley's house in Monterey, California. Uh, he was born on February 13, 1933. Uh, we are being assisted by uh, one cameraman is John uh, Quinga. Uh, the other camera is Jim Martin. Uh, they are working with KMAR uh, Industries, which is on contract with the Defense Language Institute. And Colonel Martis of the uh, Defense Language Institute has assisted uh, getting them here today. Um, General Gorley was in the Army, and he... Re um, We've got a rank of Major General, and we're going to start this interview by going back. Uh, there's there's four segments. There's one of sort of jogging your memory of your background and how you got in the military, the experiences you had, your life, uh, life after services, and um, sort of now clo and then the end of closing. So it'll 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 take a little while, and you can say anything you want. Why don't you tell I us? I promise it'll all be the truth. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how you got into the Army? What, what motivated you? Where you went to school, what you were doing? Well, I went to Temple University, Philadelphia, born and raised there. And often, like uh, people ask Colin Powell, what motivated him to go into ROTC? He said, man, this is a chance to make, get some money. <laughs> may even go off the block. Uh -huh. And those are very similar uh, reasons for me. So you went into ROTC and you... Went into ROTC and, and uh, had they paid you a stipend to uh, be in the program. And then they uh, had to wear your uniform uh, once a week down on Broad Street in Philadelphia. Where'd you grow up? Philadelphia. In Philadelphia. Yeah. So it was Philadelphia. Where you went to home school. So I went to home school. Took a bus, took a a bus, a trolley, and a subway to get there. Were your uh, relatives in any been in the military? Yeah, I think two of my three uncles were in World War One. What was your father's occupation? My father was a locomotive engineer. Oh. And he would. Uh, Correct anyone if he said you were a, a, an engineer, you were a locomotive engineer. And he was a locomotive engineer for a very famous railroad known to people by Monopoly as the Reading Railroad. The well, Reading Railroad, that's right. <laughs> anyone out west will say, you mean the Reading Railroad? You know, I... My, our, my father's family was involved in the, uh, on the, on me and the car mail cars and things. They were railroad employees. Yeah. Maybe our maybe our paths crossed way back then. So that's where he that's where he uh, reared us all in a row house. And uh, frankly, going to the temple was a a good break for me. Uh, yeah, we didn't have a lot of financial mm -hmm. wealth. And Temple's always been known as a blue-collar school. It's a great school. Yeah, it's a great school. So what year did you graduate? Do you remember that? 1955. Bill Cosby was two years behind me. Oh. Did you uh, know him at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you graduated, did you, you became a lieutenant? Well, the way the, prog yeah, the, way the program works, you... you um, once you become a, a, a junior, then they make a cut of who they want. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to stay on, then you stay on in this junior and senior year. So uh, I made the cut, obviously, and I wanted to stay on. So uh, when I graduated uh, in... June of uh, 1955, well, I went down to Convention Hall in Philadelphia, and the uh, guest speaker was supposed to be a friend of the president, President Eisenhower. Uh -huh. 
I'm supposed to be our guest speaker, commencement speaker. But uh, the president got the flu, so a man named Richard Nixon came to be his substitute. So at the end of the program, when everybody was graduated, yeah. about 22 was lined up in the stage, and uh, Mr. Nixon pinned our second lieutenant bars on. Wow. So... That's something to be said. Yeah, so you were a second lieutenant. Second lieutenant. And the Korean, you weren't, uh, then you didn't have to go right into, the Korean War was over? The Korean War ended just about March, April. Uh, but we didn't know that yet. We we thought our first, first deal was Fort Benning and then Korea. But uh, I guess fortunately for us, the war ended, so my first tour of duty was Fort Ord. Wow, so you came out here into California. Came right out to California. And do you remember anything about those first uh, experiences, uh, being in the military, anybody, any particular, anything, anybody or any person in the military stand out, any instructors or uh, uh, whatever, your first days in the service, what it was like? Yeah, actually, it was a it was a um, it was kind of a tough period because the Korean War had just ended, and they had uh, downsized the army and the other services, and so suddenly we found a, a lot of people who were officers who didn't have twenty years in, mm -hmm. so they made them master sergeants which was the highest rank in those days. And they served two or three years as a master sergeant to get their 20 in. And frankly, they were a handful to a young second lieutenant. I took more orders from them <laughs> than I gave, I think. And that was, were they here at Fort Ord as well? And, yeah, yeah, they were here at Fort Ord. And uh, I uh, ran a lot of rifle ranges so what um, was your job at the first the first assignments? Do you remember? I was a platoon leader of a an infantry company, infantry battalion, and we kind of took the trainees, fired their weapons, took them on night exercises, and you know. I understand that Fort Ord was the first training base in the United States that was integrated. Did you see some of that uh, in the fifties? It was still it was it was still young in the integration. Yeah, I was I was here in actually fifty eight uh, fifty uh, five, but I was here in September fifty five, and I didn't see a lot of the integration because I think uh, Truman signed the memorandum around fifty five or fifty six, and frankly, I think a lot of the army. Who hummed it? Mm -hmm. Fort Ord didn't. This was the very first place we had integrated uh, barracks, integrated training. I'm, I'm kind of proud of that because that's a. Uh, it was um, first being an Easterner. Mm -hmm. That was that was very common to me, and I wouldn't have understood the other way. So, uh, yeah, we were all in it together. We had black lieutenants in the VOQ, and we were all buddies. And you know, I think it was those things we don't realize how, how, va how um, valuable and rich it's made the Monterey Peninsula in people, because had we not had the military base here and not had that integration, I mean that brought brought the African American population to to this area. No and, question. You know, obviously, they remained and became very successful and very involved in the community. Just what a dull community we'd have if it wasn't for the military being here. There's no question about that. The military integrated this peninsula, and it became known throughout the army. If you were uh, married to a, black or white or African or whatever, Fort Ord was a good assignment because people understood 
that everybody was equal. Yeah, and in some states at that time, it's still interracial marriages were were, were prohibited. Yeah. So I can believe that in today's world. So I, I did. I didn't hardly feel any of that, which was a nice feeling. So uh, my days at Fort Ord were very memorable. Uh, Is it was it here in Fort Ord that you uh, you met your wife? Yep. Mary, Mary Quarrier. Mary Quarrier met her. So you were at Fort Ord, and you went up to San Francisco. She was from the Bay Area. Yes, no, she was from Modesto. Modesto. And she was down here with her parents. You know, in the in the valley, they come down in the summertime to... Get a little fog. Get a little fog. <laughs> cool off. So they um, were down here, and somehow I got invited to a, a party at Pebble Beach. You know, they always like the couple uniform. They said, wear your uniform, you know. <laughs> So I wore my uniform, and about five of us went at this party, and she was there. And we all started talking, and started there. I, uh, being a good slick Easterner, I asked her for a telephone number, and uh, she was cute enough to give it to me. <laughs> and uh, was it love at first sight, or was it was pretty? Yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, there is such thing as love at first sight. And so you... Fall. You don't know it right away, but <laughs> it sinks in after a while. Yeah. And you realize yeah, that. I believe it. And um, so how long after you, you met her before you were married? Um, I think a year. Were you still stationed here at Fort Ord? Still stationed at Fort Ord. I used to drive my old Studebaker over the Vajayco Pass, hoping I'd get over. <laughs> that was before the freeway. Yeah. It was a windy road, and all those cars at top were over there, uh, yeah, radiators so, boiling over. So we, we were married actually in Modesto, here in 57, lived in Carmel for a year. Oh. That's a nice way to start them. Yeah. Know. Oh, I told her all kinds of things. You know, <laughs> this is going to be magnificent. And I'll bring you back to Fort Ord every other year, you know. And I don't know what the hell I was talking about. <laughs> but uh, it, it was, um, yeah, we lived in Carmel, right across the street from Casanova. Oh, yeah. The restaurant. Yeah. The apartment's still there. Yeah. Wow, we used to we often drove by it. A lot of a lot of uh, officers uh, lived off base. Did they have? Uh, did you have? Um, there wasn't enough housing in Fort Ord, so they, did you have? <clears throat> yeah, there wasn't enough housing. Housing allowance. And so if they have, if you applied, you could live off base, mm -hmm. and they would give you your quarters allowance, which you could use for rent. As, you, as part of your rent, so. Um, yeah, I, I did. I did actually move off of Fort Ord. Moved into a little building still there in Pacific Grove, right across from um, Washington Park. There was a lot of little like cabins mm -hmm. for me and my one buddy. Put our money together, and we rented that place for about a year. By the time I was courting Molly. In fact, I proposed to her there. Oh. So were you, uh, how long were you, what was your next assignment after after uh, Fort Ord? Well. What a lucky assignment for you, Fort Ord, and you met a woman who married her. I thought, I had a mess hall right across the street that was feeding me, you know, and I said, hell, this is too good to be true. <laughs> um, and I was regular army. Mm-hmm. Because if you graduate as a distinguished military graduate from a ROTC, which is the top 5%, I think, they offer you regular army. In those days, regular army was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Regular army, you didn't have to re-up. You were guaranteed a 20-year career. No questions asked. 
I said, screw it up. So I was a regular army officer, and uh, so my first assignment came as, uh, okay, now you've had some good times. Now you're going down to Fort Benning, Georgia. I'm going to make a real infantryman out of you. So I went down to Benning, Molly and I, drove across, across, across the country in a Volkswagen. I have no idea how you, we did that. You have no air conditioning, no nothing. Just Greyhound buses. <laughs> But, yeah, it was uh, probably quite a luxury to take your own car. A lot of people were still traveling by rail in those days and buses. So we went to Fort Benning for uh, 10 months, I guess. And uh, a funny thing happened, which kind of changed my life a little bit, is I came down on orders to go to Germany, 3rd Army Division. And I had concurrent travel which means you could take your wife, your family. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you got orders that said no concurrent travel. That meant you went... You went alone. You went alone, and after you established yourself in the quarters, then you could ask the Army to bring your family over. So I had these f fabulous orders <coughs> that said con concurrent travel. And I also had applied for jump school. And I asked this captain, I said, what do I do? I said, I want to go to jump school. Everybody says, concurrent travel is really a big deal. He said, take the concurrent travel. Mm -hmm. So I never went to jump school. I was headed that way. I was one week away from going to jump school, but... They convinced me that concurrent travel was... And where were you uh, assigned in Germany? I was assigned to Kurt Gorn's Germany, Combat Command A, 3rd Armored Division, which is near Bootsbach, Germany, which is north of Frankfurt. I name all that because oh. when I got off the airplane... In Frankfurt, I was asking for help. I said, what, what train gets me to Kirchgorn's? And no one knew what the hell I was talking about. And finally I said, Bootsbach. And that, that gave him a clue, because mm -hmm. it, it was a bigger city. Kirchgorn was nothing more than, we call it the Rock. It was a combat uh, command A. In those days, uh, the 3rd Army Division was combat command A, B, and C. A was at uh, the Rock, Kurtzkorn's. B was in Gelnhausen. And C was at Freeburg. Um, I may as well say this now. Concurrently with me arriving at Kurtzkorn's, we had a um, full division parade like two weeks later because parades were big things in those days. Because, you know, we were waiting for the Russians and we were tuned up and everything, but to keep us busy, we'd have parades all the time. Mm -hmm. So we had this big parade. This was right after you arrived. Yeah. I was as fresh as a daisy. <laughs> and maybe the XO of a co infantry company. And uh, so we had this big division parade where all the compact commands came. And there's where I met a guy who we all know who was in the 3rd Armored Division. He was there at the exact same time I was, Elvis Presley. Oh, my God. Elvis Presley was in the Third Army. You, so you, were you, were you've you? probably seen some of his movies. <laughs> Third Army Division patch. He was uh, in Combat Command C. Were you his commanding officer? No, no, no. I, I was. I was in. I was in Combat Command A. He was in a whole other 
But everybody knew who he was, didn't they? Oh, yeah, everybody knew who he was. And uh, I met Elvis a couple of times. I see rations with him one time up uh, at Graffenvere where we used to go train. It just so happened that we were having uh, sea rations. This jeep pulled out, pulled up and said, do you mind if I get behind the logs with you? Because there was a bunch of logs that we were kind of huddled behind. It was Elvis. And Elvis and I were eating our sea rations with our plastic spoon. He was a good guy. He was a clean-cut guy. Mm -hmm. He never, never gave the army one ounce of trouble. No, actually, didn't he help the army with some? He was good recruiting efforts. And yeah, he was very, very good. He uh, got to be a spec four, which in those days was good. That was if you stayed in three years and made spec four, you did. He did. That was good. And that's how long he was in. Yeah. So anyway, Elvis, Elvis was there. So where did you, did you and Molly have housing? Yeah, we had... Um, base housing, or would you have to live in the community? We had base housing, because with concurrent travel, I guarantee you housing. Any of the kids yet born? Michael. Michael, the, the uh, oldest son. Old, oldest son. So we moved into government quarters. Was he born in uh, the United States or in Germany? United States. So we went over with, with three... Came back with uh, four. Oh, came back with three. Came back with five. And Mary Jean was born. So your other two daughters. Um, they were both. Uh, Cecily and Caroline. Cecily and Cecily and Caroline. Cecily and Caroline were born in Germany. They were both born in the 97th General Hospital, Frankfurt, Germany. Swastikas all over the place. Really. This is right after the war, Sam. Uh -huh. The Bonhoeff had broken windows in it still. Yeah, I remember those. And... Yeah, Frankfurt was beautiful. The opera house was a pile of stones. So yeah, they were both born in uh, the Army 97th General Hospital. But uh, I remember those uh, seeing a lot of that bombing damage. I was there as a high school student between my junior and senior year from Carmel High School working with the uh, Quakers and the Mennonites. Just, I wanted a summer job where I could go to Europe. And I remember I was in Bond, and it was, the train station was all Bond. Uh, it, was, it was really, it really shocked me uh, seeing that. Until you see it, yeah, you didn't realize, yeah, you saw the sketchy pictures, but until you saw the Bonhoeff with no windows, mm -hmm. The opera house ruined, and uh, you know it was just a. As an army officer, what did you? What did any? Did you have any feelings about that? Do you remember any specific? No, I guess uh, most of my officers were either the Korean War veterans, mm -hmm. or General Abrams was my commanding general. Of Abrams Tank. Of Abrams Tank. In fact, I was his, his aide to camp for a year. You have a story about that, too. I do. Let's wait. Let's catch up, though. We're in Germany, and now... We're, we're in Germany, we're, where and... Where are we going next? Or how long? Anything particular you remember about that? Other no, I just did a lot of soldiering and running up hills. I was there during the Berlin Wall. Mm-hmm. And they put the Berlin Wall up. We were we went out to what we call our GAO positions, general alert positions, mm -hmm. which were all predetermined. You know, it was our defense positions. Our biggest advantage over the Russians is we were dug in. We knew where we were, and they had to come at us. We were confident we could take them. So did that influence where the wall was built? How did they determine the boundaries there? I mean, was well, they no the the boundary of the wall just sep separated the, the Russian zone from the British, British zone. French, and the American zone. Uh, 
He just put it up overnight. Well, we didn't know what was going on. Man. We were so cranked that we had our howitzers that had nuclear capability. We had put mercury in them, which raises them. Mm -hmm. We thought, they're coming. And it turned out it was the Berlin Wall. Wow. That is, that's fat. I've never heard that. I mean, you're the first person to be talking about being there when that, when that Yeah, I, I've seen it when it was up, and I've been up there twice since it's been down. I used to go up a lot of times on visits when, when I was... As a general officer, I used to go over and we'd have to check out Berlin, see what they're doing. And we used to helicopter around the wall, see if it, we used to see um, the last prisoner, Hess. Mm. Hess was the last prisoner. I remember flying over the prison. And he was always at the same bench, reading a book every time I saw him. Hmm. Albert Hess. So a lot of history. Yeah, you were there right when it was all I was there when the aftermath of uh, World War II. Did you travel around Europe much, or you pretty much stay, uh, kept to Germany? Uh, we, we managed a trip to Switzerland and Italy. But that's about as far as you went. Uh, what did Molly think of all that? I can only imagine. She was... She what? had two kids one year and apart. She was taking care of them, and I was always going off to the field. We went to the field a lot. We worked every Saturday. Sunday was off. Were there a lot of other spouses with children there, or was Mom? Oh yeah, yeah. So she had the whole village, the whole, whole Bootsbach village, was full of family. The men just weren't there. But uh, how long were you stationed there? Three years. A little more than three years. Then where? The highlight of my whole thing, and I guess I should have brought a picture up is. I have a picture of General Abrams putting my captain bars on. Oh, that's quite a, that was quite a thrill. Did you uh, know how uh, famous he was when he, he, he became? Well, he was a hero of Bastogne, you know. Uh -huh. He was the lead tank that went into Bastogne. All I knew is he stayed away from him because he was rough and tough. All those World War II guys were... They were lean and mean. They had hard rules. And lieutenants were nothing to them. <laughs> <laughs> so you just kind of stayed in the, in the far in the background as you could. But uh, How about when he pinned his bars on him, when he pinned the captain bars on him? Well, actually, uh, that all happened because my battalion commander in Combat Command A was appointed his G1. And he called me in, he said, Carl, you at the temple and you have a business education degree. I said, yes, sir. He says, does that mean you can write? I said, yeah, I can write pretty well. I'm taking you to Frankfurt with me. That was it. So we moved to Frankfurt, Germany. We stayed up there for another year and a half. That's when I got to know him a little bit. He bumped to me in the hall and he said, Lieutenant, what are you doing here? I said, I'm going to a meeting in room 107, sir. He said, are you on my staff? <laughs> I said, yes, sir, I am. I'm in your G1. He shouldn't have lieutenants on division staffs. He walked away. <laughs> How'd that make you feel? Uh, concerned. Yeah. But, yeah, he was rougher than his, his bark was rougher than his bite. Mm -hmm. And I breathed him several times and 
actually uh, one of his junior leads had a family problem. And so, to my surprise, he called me up and he said, you think you can be my junior aide for a year without getting in trouble? I said, yes, sir. So, that's the way it went. Uh, General Bill Lizzie, I don't think you would know him. He rose to be a four-star. He was a senior aide. He kept saying, no, don't do that. He doesn't like that. Do this. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. <laughs> so... But it was, it was an interesting uh, time. So I left Germany as a captain. Uh, With three kids. Three kids. And I went to Fort, went off to Fort Ben Harrison to the AG school. Oh. Learned, learned about personnel. Uh -huh. And then uh, after that, The Army selected me to go to uh, graduate school, which was really a neat opportunity. You apply for it, but very few people get it. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what their criteria is, but they and said... they pay for it, too. They pay your, yeah. your, for your rent to get a master's degree? Yeah, they said, you are hereby... Business degree? Enrolled in Indiana University for a master's degree in business. You report such and such a date, so I took the family, went down to Bloomington, and uh, I actually did my MBA, which is a two-year program. I did it a year and a half because I went through the summer. Because mm -hmm. you know, you didn't have a summer vacation. <laughs> I didn't figure the Army wanted me to take the summer off. Yeah. <laughs> so I went through two summers, which made up a full semester. So I got my MBA, and before I had my orders, before I took my comp, you know, the big test, which if you don't pass, doesn't mean anything the previous two years, because it's like, like passing a law. Mm-hmm. You have to pass the comp in order to be an MPA. Mm -hmm. And it was known to be tough. Yeah. It tested all your two years of your... It was a case study. And you had to answer all the questions to the case study. Like one question would be, what would you do to rejuvenate the financial structure of this firm? So you had to think... Yeah, to be... So anyway, I... And they said, don't worry. If you don't pass this year, a lot of people don't. You can, in six months, you can go back and it's easier the second time. I said, not for me. I got orders of Vietnam. There ain't no correspondence course over there. So I was really under the gun. Most pressure I ever felt in my life. Hmm. Taking that comp because of a one-time shot. Yeah. It was two years down the drain or two years of glory. And they were so nice that you would agree to uh, score my paper first. It was a blue book, you know? Mm -hmm. Two blue books. So they agreed that they would... How'd you do? They said, go to Korea, you passed. It was a pass or fail. Mm -hmm. You didn't get A, B. Yeah. Because either you passed or you didn't. So with that, you got a, you, you get a master's in business administration and they send you to Korea, I mean to uh, Vietnam. That was my utilization tour. <laughs> so yeah, I went to Korea, I took it to Vietnam, and I uh, was there. And the family was li in living now, living in, living there? Took the family to Modesto, California. So to Molly's parents, or Molly's hometown. Molly's hometown found an apartment. Mm -hmm. And uh, what year are we talking about? about? Um, 61, 62, 62. 62. 62. Well, Vietnam hadn't really, uh, it was still it, under it, the wire. It was uh, kind of. 
on the QT and, and Kennedy was president. When I arrived in, in Vietnam, there were 10,000 of us. 10,000, and it wasn't, I mean, the, 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 they hadn't made a lot of news yet, though. Yeah, it was starting to, because when I left 14 months later, we had 300,000 there. And it was just one year of trying to keep up with growth. One of my jobs was to to go out to the new units and indoctrinate them in the handbooks of how to how to do things, how to stay alive, uh, how to avoid ambush. You know, ten ways to to avoid a disaster. So I used to fly out to all these new units, mm. Marines, everybody. I used to hold these classes. And sometimes we get interrupted with a firefight. It was crazy. You never knew what was going to happen. One minute you'd be talking to a bunch of Guys sitting on steel pots. Next minute you're wearing your steel pot, firing back at the enemy. That was the beginning of sort of an asymmetrical warfare, wasn't it? I mean, it was not uh, the old traditional, they're over here and we're over here. And... Yeah. Uh, some wore uniforms and some didn't. You didn't know who was who. A little village girl. Joe O'Meal, I don't know if you know him, he went to the war college with me. He told me he went to language school here. He said it saved his life because he went to language school. To learn Vietnamese? To learn Vietnamese. Because uh -huh. he said when they waded ashore, there was a welcoming committee of Vietnamese. Villagers, you know, and all that. And this little girl, he was in a tank. He brought the tank ashore. The little girl came up with a Vietnamese hat, a bouquet of flowers in it, and his translator hollered in Vietnamese, hang grenade. He pulled the tank top down, and the hand grenade went off. On top of the tank, but not inside it. But that, that's the kind of war it was. Wow. You didn't know who was who. Um, I lived in Cholong, which is a Chinese portion of Saigon. And it was the toughest part. Uh, we had little cubicles. I think I was about four levels down. Slept on a, my bed was an air mattress for six months. Finally, I, somebody gave me a, a bed mattress. What was the food like? They had a restaurant uh, there. It was RB food. It was okay. Did you keep a diary or anything where you were, how did you communicate with your family? I wrote Molly just about every night. Didn't tell her the bad stuff, just told her the good stuff. Uh, the thing about Vietnam was the unknown. One minute it could be a tranquil little village, and next minute it could be hell all pre-planned. So you never really ever, you almost slept with one eye open because you didn't know what was going to happen. But after a while, you know, the human body even again gets adjusted to that. I got to the point where I could sleep pretty well. But for a while, you don't. And uh, I had a lot of good friends that I had breakfast with, that I wouldn't have dinner with. 
if they didn't come back. It must be a hell of a psychological problem. I mean, we, for now we're spending a lot of time with post-traumatic syndrome. It seems to me that losing your colleagues and buddies and being in a living in this uh, mystery life of not knowing from day to day no certainties. Yeah, there, there, nothing was a given. There were no certainties. I learned a long time ago, I was like after three months there, I avoided crowds. Because I, I knew that they went for the big, the big bang. And they would never throw a hand grenade or something at one person. As long as they had a group. So, I used to walk to work different ways. I never ate lunch with a crowd. It was just my way. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being antisocial, but I found that to be the best way to stay alive. Secondly, I learned that the first thing that goes off is always followed by a second thing. <clears throat> we were having a meeting, about 25 of us, and all hell broke loose. The chandelier was full of ball bearings. They had, had uh, rigged it. These ball bearings were bouncing all over the place, killing people. People were crawling out. And uh, it was salacious. And I, we all, those of us got out, I think about two-thirds got out. We were kind of around the building. And this one guy said, let's go help our buddies. And I said, wait 10 minutes. About eight minutes, a bigger blast went off. Hmm, they're just waiting you to... That would have killed all the people who'd gone to help. Who'd gone to help. They knew all that stuff. They knew how he operated. And uh, when it went off, they all said, thanks. But, you know, it's just things you learned how to stay alive. With all this um, stress, was there any... Um Humor? Do you remember any humorous incidents? Yeah, you got to uh, you got to laugh at things that weren't necessarily funny, mm -hmm. but you almost laughed at yourself. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was humor. <clears throat> the Australians were one camp up, and they were always a kick. They would invite us every once in a while to one of their bashes. Australians are wonderful people, but they're all crazy. <laughs> would you play jokes on the Australians or vice versa? Play a little... Uh... I'll see them on us. Uh -huh. The one thing that struck me about the Australians, and I know I'm rambling, I hope I'm not going on too much, but whenever they had a party or decided to have one, they would get down to the bloody hospital. I don't know how they did it, but they would go in that hospital and they'd get all their buddies who were in the hospital. They'd put them on stretchers and they took them to the party. They'd bring them to the party. Uh, when the party was over, they took them back. Wow. What a team, team effort. Huh? Team, team effort. And uh, it was very... Uh, very moving, I imagine. It was very moving to see how everybody and that kind of gave you a good morale to see that. that. That's laughing at yourself. See a bunch of guys, one arm, one leg, they're there being given a sip of beer by one of their buddies. You say, that, that's all right. That's pretty cool. Any particular officers that stood out in, Korea, in uh, Vietnam? Or any personnel, per, anything particular that came out of your friendships or uh, experiences there? Uh, 
Because I was so diversified and traveled so much, I had a headquarters and a boss. Uh, I got to meet Maxwell Taylor. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you an off the cuff story. Uh, they gave a whole bunch of the coal, a whole bunch of us in and said, we got to get the dependents out of here. This thing is getting too hot. So they said, you all have been designated to form a task force to get them out of here. Do the dependents of, of U.S. civilians or dependents? All of civilians. Of, 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 of Everybody. People who were shopkeepers turned out to be CIA agents. I mean, it was all... These were Vietnamese civilians as well as foreign civilians. No, just American. Just American civilians. There were a lot of women over there because it was concurrent travel in the beginning. And they were playing bridge in the beginning. Mm. And now it was transitioning to a hot war. So... We were ordered to get him out. You go to Guam, Wake Island, or Okinawa. That was your choice. And some of them were very cooperative. And someone said, I'm not leaving. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, we have to have a document signed by the ambassador that says you are evacuated. So we Decided that was a good idea. And uh, I got Westmoreland's aide to give him the paper to get Taylor to sign. And I waited, I waited two or three days, and they never said, where's the paper? We can't get so he's busy. So I took the paper, and I took a Inventory of his signature. I signed it myself. That's probably a court martial offense. Saved somebody's life. But it got them all out. They saw that piece of paper signed by Maxwell Taylor. They said, I'm out of here. I haven't told that story to too many people. <laughs> I think that's leadership. Um, so then, I, I, how long were you in... Vietnam. 14 months. Now, had your youngest child been born yet, Mary Jane? Yes. So she, she was in she, Modesto. With... She was born when I was at uh, Fort Ben Harrison. Uh -huh. So they were all living in Modesto, all four of them. So you had a wife and four children to come back to. And what year did you come back? Sixty-six. Wow, that's just when it was starting the real, the the real real push build up. Huh? So you must have been a lot of questions, a lot of uh, what was the? It was kind of ugly in in the states, wasn't it? By then, by sixty-six. Yeah, but I didn't see any the war, that. The war protests were starting to really yeah. uh, move. I didn't see any of that. It was the, it was the guys getting out who saw most of that. I was regular army. I went from. So you went to another military. I went from Viet, Vietnam to, to uh, working on the National Military Command Center, JCS, as a captain. So I just went to the Pentagon. Yeah, so you were still surrounded by DOD all the time and not. Bought a home in Arlington. Not San Francisco's protest. Yeah. We bought a home in Arlington, and I went to work. What was your rank then? Captain. Captain. And uh, which got me no respect at all at JCS. You know, everybody's captains, colonel, captain navy, colonels, generals. And uh, I finally got promoted to major there. I got a, I got a fast promotion. To, what was uh, your assignment? I worked in the uh, 
asked the military command center and manned uh, the, the health man, I was in the Asian desk to manned Asia. And as messages came in, you might remember um, there was a code word for B-52 bombs, bombers. And every one of those flights, bombing flights, if you believe it or not, had to come back and be approved by the Joint Chiefs. So we would get messages like that mm -hmm. at our desk, stamp flash on it, which meant the highest. Read it as soon as you get it. If you're reading Top Secret, put it down. And, uh, I forget the name of it, but it was, a, it was a good name. And they would get the request from uh, Westmoreland to do such and such. And then they would send him back the reply. We never saw the reply. But uh, so we were an integral, we were the link between the war front where I came from to the communications center at got a at the Pentagon. At the Pentagon. How long were you stationed there in Washington? Three full years. Three full years. And that was from sixty six to sixty nine? About? About. That was the height of the war, wasn't it? You were really you were in the trenches. Yeah, it was really hot and heavy. Sometimes we would only process flash messages. Flash, immediate. Sometimes we never got to immediate, which is high. It was so hot and heavy, sometimes we only processed flash messages. Hmm. It, was that in, it was that intense. Uh, do you remember Westmoreland and any of the other? I mean, what what other experiences being in the Department of Defense at the height of the Vietnam War? What was it? What was your? Oh, I got to meet Mr. McNamara several times. Mm -hmm. well, one on a, on a very bad occasion. Uh, I had a message. He knocked on the door. It was all locked, and he said, "I want to see a message." Number so and so. Yes, sir. I uh, pulled the message out and it said, Flash, chairman's eyes only. Period. So, excuse me. So I had to go back to the door and say, Sir, I cannot give you this message because it's marked for the chairman's eyes only. Not the Chairman world. of the Joint Chiefs. Yeah. Not Secretary. No. It's chairman. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, there goes my career. He slammed that door and all the hinges, I think, fell off. He was pretty unhappy. And uh, I went back to the my brigadier. There's a brigadier in charge of each team chief. I just told him what happened. And he said, hell, better have him pissed off at it than the chairman. He'd have chopped your head off too. Because he, obviously he didn't want him to see it. You know, politics. So I met Mr. McNamara on a couple occasions. He never seemed to hold a grudge. Uh, but I saw a lot of I saw an awful lot of similarity in reflection to the uh, McNamara administration to the Rumsfeld administration. Wow. Very interesting. Quite a similarity. Uh, was he popular with the officers? No. 
<laughs> they're in the similarity, and, or is well, arrogance the the I, arrogance? I know it better than the arrogance was there. He was surrounded by whiz kids. Les Aspen uh -huh. later became Secretary of Defense. He left early because he screwed up because he was micromanaging. He had a whole bunch of people who micromanaged everything. And we would send in a great plan. And it would come out quite different. Mm -hmm. And I draw an analogy not between the two person, mm -hmm. the two wars, but between style. Style. Uh, when you had uh, Carter in there, Johnson, Reagan, Bush. They all seem to be more cordial. Mm -hmm. You kind of felt like you were a, a plebe around those guys. You, know, you were just a messenger boy. Around those presidents or around McNamara and, McNamara and, and, and Rumsfeld? Rumsfeld. He never said thanks. Appreciate it. You just took what you had, look, turned around and walked out. And I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but I can't help draw an analogy between the Barry McCaffrey where he would state it straight out, arrogance. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should, since I know Barry well and agree with most of him, I would think both of those people were arrogant to the point that they weren't listening as much as they should have. So it's not a sort of challenge between the military and civilian uh, roles and commands. It's more of a of an arrogance of not listening to the professionals, uh, to the to the pros in uniform. Yeah, the assumption is civilians make the decisions. But the underlying assumption is that they will surround themselves with all good generals, admirals, smart people who surround themselves with a bunch of smart colonels and give real solid advice thought out, historically you know, mm -hmm. ran through the mill and we just didn't get didn't get heard. We had the audiences, but it was almost like I, I got the feeling, and Barry, Barry McCaffrey did the same thing. He stopped going over to the White House, to the Pentagon, and at Rumsfeld's request, because he said, I went over about three times, spent two weeks each time, and every time I had an exit briefing with him. He said, thanks a lot. He didn't implement anything I gave him. Mm -hmm. So he said, the hell with it. So I'm not blaming the course of the war or anything else, but... Style. Style and personality. Style and very, personality. Very important. It's very important. So after uh, those years in the Pentagon, now we're into uh, 70s, right? Where, where are you... Uh... What was your next assignment? Let's see. I went from uh, JCS to the Army staff. I was there two years doing Army staff work. Got selected to go to the Army War College. Went up to Carlisle for a year. Did you enjoy that? One of the finest years of my life. Surrounded by really bright people. Huh? Surrounded by bright people. And from all over the world. Weren't there international officers there too? 178 great people. 
And uh, all we had to do is go to school and listen, write a few papers, give them what we, what we had been doing. This, this was heaven. Yeah. It was a nice lifestyle. With my family, had a great year. The only thing you're wrong with the War College is you know that is the end of the line as far as education. I said they should have a senior war college huh. so they could look forward to another good year. Yeah. Because you knew after that year, and you were just. So you only go to the war college once. It's not like you come back and do refresher courses and things. Just like once. You either go to ICAF. Army War College, Navy War College, Air Force War College. You get here in Monterey at the Naval Postgraduate School, one can come back several different times. Yeah. War College is a one-time shot. Oh. Any particular memories of people that were there with you? And No, except the, the faculty was extremely talented. Very, very talented. We broke into seminar groups. We had a seminar leader who was a colonel. And they knew their stuff. And you got to be the leader as a student many times under their tutelage. All I remember of the War College is the uh, first time I met General Yerkes. He was a deputy commandant. Uh, DeWitt Smith was a commandant. They were just full-packed learning years, fun family life, played a lot of sports. And... Uh, that was probably the best year in the, in the, in the military? No question. You know, it's interesting because I think it really shaped your personality. You've, you've been a uh, mentor, instructor, a leader, wherever you've gone, and, and that year must have left a... Of course, you were older when you went back, so it's not like being young, a young student. It's now... Well, yeah, and, I, and I, used, I used to like it so much, I used to go for... The, I volunteered to go from the Pentagon to the war college to give classes. Mm-hmm. And I used to insist on, uh, and I would tell them how the Army personnel system works and why this happens and why that happens and all different things happen. Because the personnel system really does kind of run the, the system, so to speak. Everything revolves around it. Mm -hmm. People come and go mm -hmm. based on decisions made. And I always used to insist that the, you couldn't come to the class unless you brought your wife. Oh. And the reason I did that is I wanted them to learn a little something. Yeah. Other things that they wouldn't come. And also... I said, the main reason you ladies are here, you're here to keep me straight on acronyms. <laughs> I stand up here and I talk. All your husbands will understand what I'm talking about. You'll say, what the hell's an RTEP? What the? You have no idea. You're still doing that. You do this Veterans Service uh, Council every year, and I remember you instructing me, don't speak in political ease. Yeah, so I used to say, if I say an acronym and you don't know what it means, raise your hand. Hell, they raise their hand all the time. <laughs> but it was fun going back. I used to call Carlisle. You know, you work, you work so hard in the Pentagon. Long hours. Tiring hours. And you go up to Carlisle and the faculty, they're all colonels. You get the same pay and a little bit of a hell of a different lifestyle. So I, I nicknamed Carlisle the hotbed of tranquility. <laughs> well, particularly after coming back from Vietnam, Carlisle, then, then what? 
At the Carlisle, I went over to Germany. Back again. Back again to Germany. Frankfurt again? No, uh, Heidelberg. Heidelberg, well, nicer down, right? Heidelberg. Actually, Svetzigen, which is a little suburb, but Heidelberg. And there I was lieutenant colonel, and they put me in charge of uh, all enlisted personnel assignments, which was a big deal. Mm -hmm. you know, we had 225,000 soldiers over there. And we used to bring... Did they try to bribe you for assignments or influence you? No, it was pretty... Yeah, some, some, some sergeants would get off the phone, get off the plane, get out of the phone booth. But we caught most of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's such a big system because it's not, it's not just high Germany. It's Italy, France, Africa. It's all over. So we used to send home every month 20,000 people and bring in 20,000 people. So it was a big job. As lieutenant colonel, I felt kind of overwhelmed. Yeah, that's a lot of people every single day. And uh, in many cases with their families too, right? Seven days a week. Families and everybody. And then I went back to the Pentagon. Uh, got a job in the B ring where everything happens. I was the, I was the uh, Army Personnel Director for personnel, hmm. which meant I worked for the Desper, and most ninety percent of his action was me. I just had to go to the hill with them, mm -hmm. prepare statements because everybody wants to know about logistics. But everybody wants to know about people. So it was a big job. And I guess after one year of doing that, General Yerkes uh, brought me in and said, my ex and I aren't just jiving. He doesn't know a personnel system like you two, and frankly, he can't help me. I'm getting in trouble. He said, would you like to be my exo? He said, because I know that you know the answers to the questions people are asking me. I said, yes, sir, that'd be an honor. He only has one exo. Death per exo. You know, the death per has an exo. Test Ops has an XO, Test Log. Chief of Staff has one XO. So there are about 10 colonels in the Pentagon who are XOs who really, really run, run the show. We would have to always meet once a week. Our bosses never got caught by surprise. And everybody knew what was going on. We would make decisions, go back and tell our bosses what, this, what they should do. And 99 out of 10 times, they said, okay. So then when they had the big meeting in the chief of staff at the Army's office on these subjects, maybe 10 or 12, they all knew what they were going to say and why. It's a very untold system. But those 10 exos, the JAG had an exo. Uh, everybody who was key, every three star who was key, had an exo who he totally relied on. And, and you know, you're like a 
congressional staffer. You know, if Rochelle tells you something. It's my chief of staff, you know. You go with it. Yeah, and, and they do meet. The chiefs of staffs meet and so that there's a plan and there's a schedule. And so I became his exo. And that was hard work. Because he stayed longer than anybody else. Mm -hmm. We used to get to work sometimes five. He lived at Fort Myer. Where did you live at the time? Um, Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. I had a townhouse in Mount Vernon. Is the family with you, or are they still... Family's with me. So they moved back and forth across this country quite a few times, didn't they? Yeah, they... Uh, they were in Washington a total of 13 years. We called it home. And uh, so I became his exo. And uh, it was no secret. Half of getting promoted to brigadier was being one of these 10 guys because you were kind of hand-picked. So, you know, there's no guarantees about anything. But I did come out on the brigadier list. And uh, that was wonderful. And General Marr comes into the charm school. He was the chief of staff then. Remember him? Yeah. J.C. Mars. He gave us a nice pep talk. I'm just thinking as you were talking, uh, you're in the background, you can hear the, uh, it's um, 5 o'clock on a Sunday night, and you can hear the taps at the, at the Defense Language Institute. You're yeah. always, you're living in this, you don't have that sound where I live, and it's just in this. I'm living in the right. perfect world. You get, you get a constant reminder. Don't you? Anyway, J.C. Myers, I guess there was 36 of us on the list. Pete Dawkins is on my list. And he was, did you know him when he was stationed here at Fort Ord? Or I knew him in Korea. Korea. Yeah, I knew I served with him in Korea almost the whole time. Great guy. Did he make? He made Brigadier. He made Brigadier General. If anything, the Army abused him. He would always be calling him back. He had a battalion. He'd always be calling him back to give a speech at some banquet. CG, the second division, would get pissed off. You always have to go back. Well, sir, I tell him I don't, I don't want to go back. He said, well, you know you have to. But everybody used to kind of... Well, he was a superstar celebrity being uh, the lonesome man that... Uh, no, he wasn't the lonesome man. Was he? That was, uh, that was Bill... But he played on that team. And was an All-American, right? He was. Remember Harry Clark? Remember the name. MNRA? He was a, in the same class as Pete. Pete was All-American. Army went undefeated. He won the Heisman Trophy. Went over to Oxford. Had never played... Uh, rugby made the all Oxford rugby team. The guy could do anything. Phenomenal. Wonderful man. But getting back to our charm school. Oh, in fact, I was sitting two seats away from Pete. General Marr said, Now, just the level of the playing field here, I know you guys think you're on top of the earth, and you are. You're proud of yourself. You're 36 out of thousands. He said, but don't give up the fight because 50% of you will make two stars and 55% of you will retire as one stars. Wow. That, that's, that sends you out on a competitive... Uh-huh. <laughs> And that's the ratio. And actually, beyond two stars, it's really kind of political 
and what needs if the army needs a logistician big time then they make a three star it's all about the needs and and politics but uh Two stars I'm very proud of. I worked hard for him. I was surrounded by great people. And probably when people ask me what was my most biggest asset to getting promoted, I say good fortune. Hmm. Good luck. Well, there's probably some of that in all of it. Not getting injured or killed or otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. But I also think there's a lot of talent in you, and you obviously displayed that moving here. So you you retire with two stars. Uh, when was that? Uh, 1990. It was 36 years. Were you in Washington when you retired? No, I was at Fort McPherson. I was, at the time, I was Colonel Powell's chief of staff. Oh. And actually, Colin Powell had wanted me to come with him to uh, JCS. Because uh-huh. he was going to be the chairman. Chairman of the, of the Joint Chiefs. Joint Chiefs. He wanted me to be his J1. Yeah, use those acronyms. Remember, we have to raise our... <laughs> he wanted me to be his J1. We talked about it. And I said... You know, General Powell, I, I spent my whole career building the Army up to 880,000. I know it's coming, and I don't want to be part of the takedown, because it would have been my job. Mm-hmm. Or I would have told the services what to do. After huh? the quadrennial review and the, and the idea that we were going to downsize the military in post-Cold War... The, uh, what they call it, the, the, the war benefit or something that we could get, that we could downsize. The war of attrition. I knew they wouldn't get the right number. They never do. They took it far too low. Instead of 16 divisions, instead of going to 10, 12 or 13 probably would have been about right. We would have had the people to send. But as you know, decisions are made. So Colin Powell goes, is, goes to be um, chairman of the Chiefs and um, my Chiefs. And you retire and come to California? Correct. In fact, uh, Molly bought this house. I hadn't seen it. I signed all the papers. Oh, well, the smartest thing ever did. <laughs> Absolutely. And Colin called me into his office and he said, because we had a flying team. Mm-hmm. They'd go around and inspect. And I was the chief of staff, so I was the chief of staff of that. I got the dubious distinction to sit across the desk from him. The other colonels, other generals got nice plus seats and went to sleep. And he said, uh, Bill, we either have to go to Fort Ord or Fort Lewis. He said, we haven't been to either place for a long time. What do you recommend? So I think we ought to go to Fort Ord, sir. He knew, what he, he knew what he was doing. So we flew out on our big Air Force plane, landed in Monterey. Molly picked me up, and John Powell said, you got one hour, the inspection starts. So I ran out of here, saw the house, dashed out there, did the inspection, flew back to Atlanta. All in one one day, huh? One long day. It is a long. A round trip to Washington is a long day. It's eleven hours. Um, but uh, going and coming total. 
So that's what I did. That's what I did uh, in the army. And I can briefly tell you what I did after the army. Yeah, let's do that. We'll, we'll kind of wrap it up a little bit. Just sort of the years after. There's, there's very interesting in the. When, when did your did the day your service ended? Uh, Thirty-one December, eighty-nine. And where were you? Right here. In Monterey. Yeah, I had taken I had taken two weeks leave to PCS. I'm going to change the station. Move my stuff out here. Move it all in. So you became very involved with Fort Ord when it was still in active duty before BRAC, and but you weren't uh, in, you weren't stationed here other than your first assignment. Yeah, in fact, I came here and uh, Jim Moore Boulevard, as I call him, asked me if I would help him. I said, yeah, but I got a job in Chicago that I have to go to first to uh, get a couple extra dollars in my pocket. As soon as I finish that, I'll come back and help you. So I went to Chicago. I hadn't even floated a resume. Mm -hmm. And there's a firm called Deloitte and Touche. Yep, big one. Okay. Well, they were Deloitte Haskins and Sells. Mm -hmm. And then there was Touche Ross. Mm -hmm. And they kept interviewing people to be the merger. Their systems were different. Their paces were different. Their personnel, personnel systems were different. Everything was different. They were different. So they hired me to be their merger guy because I didn't have any corporate baggage. Were you clean coming in from the military with your master's degree? And Everybody was enamored with a general. Yeah. The Lloyd people, they didn't like this guy from the corporate world. Two did. Two like this guy from the corporate world. The Lloyd did. So I came in and did about 14 interviews in one day. Oh, my God. Talking to all the big... So did you get the job? Talking to all the big seniors. Did you want the job? Well, it seemed intriguing. But Molly was here in Monterey, right, with her kids? Yeah. But I knew I had to go and get some mm -hmm. secondary income because we were up to our up here with the house. Sure, buying a house. And, and we wanted to do a lot of renovation and fix it up. And uh, so they offered me a pretty handsome salary. And uh, at that time, Northwest Airlines called me up and wanted to interview me, but Deloitte has can and sells. Well, you were a hot item. Touche Ross. Let's, let's, we got to stop for a minute here because they got to change the tape. Okay, we uh, switched tapes here and we were uh, talking about your uh, post, uh, your retirement. You you're, got this house in Monterey. I <laughs> came out, flew out with uh, uh, General Powell uh, to, and uh, signed the papers, flew back to Washington and then came back and you're retired and needing to have a job and you were getting interviewed from everybody you just started talking about also uh getting a offer or at least to ask for an interview with what northwestern airlines you said? northwest yeah. northwest one thing i want to back up and, and really document because um elma powell and molly were very good friends oh we lived two houses hit from each other because we all lived on General's Row. And they were good friends. And I knew Colin from Germany. Uh -huh. I knew him, we knew each other when we were captains. I knew him when he was a, 
Brigadier. I went up and briefed him two days before he got the call from Reagan to come back as a corps commander. So we knew each other real well. It was how we yes sir, no sir stuff. But, but uh, Colin had a lot of trust in me. He used to tell me, I don't think this is going to work, but I said, God damn, I must trust him. You know, I'm going to say, okay. And, That's wonderful. And uh, we'd make it work. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go back and document one thing. That when I was getting all my hip hip arrays and everything uh, at Fort McPherson, and it was a beautiful day, the band was there, the cannons were blasting off and everything else. And I asked General Yerk to come down to be my host. So he was the speaker, so to speak. Um, this is your retirement? My retirement. Okay. While we were standing out there, they came out and they gave me the Distinguished Service Medal, which is pretty high picking jail. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a Joe Officer Good Conduct medal. It's given out pretty sparingly, actually. And I was just elated with that. But General Powell, I'm sure through Elma, gave Molly the highest civilian award she can get. Really? I didn't know that. I, I got a, the award in there. They pinned it right on her. She was really surprised. And uh, appropriate words were said that uh, Bill could have hardly made this trip without Molly. What a day. What a day. And as we're doing this interview, I'm, it hasn't been said that Molly, who you were married to for how many years? 50 years. 50 years. 50 wonderful years. And Molly just had a horrible bout of it's cancer. With cancer and passed away, and I was privileged to be able to join you and your family and friends. Uh, what, a, what a distinguished group of friends uh, walked into that chapel in Burlington Cemetery just about a month ago, a couple of months ago. It was... And what a medal. So she won that. I don't think that it was even mentioned. I didn't remember that, but it might be in the program. No, it wasn't in the program. Uh, she wore a little pin, you know, your little pin you wore in your lapel. Uh -huh. The medal's in there. I'll show it to you. It's quite, quite attractive. She was surprised, and General Powell was very, you know, he does. He was really smiling. But getting beyond the, um, the retirement, I knew I needed some uh, additional income to deal with the house. And I, and I told you about Northwestern and Deloitte, Haskin and Sells and Two Draws. So I went to Chicago to be interviewed. And they were all fascinated by me. They didn't... Hadn't interviewed a general. They never interviewed a general. <laughs> they said, what do you want us to ask you? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. You're the... I'm here to answer your questions. So there's one guy in particular. He said, he's trying to be hardcore. He said, you know, this is a different world out here. He said, you generals can issue an order, and it's followed instantly. Out here, you may give an order, and if they don't like it, they won't follow it. And I said, you are very naive about the military. Generals and admirals who issue bad orders don't get complied with either. 
soldiers know what to do and what not to do. So when I issue an order to tell Bragg to do something, if it's not smart, I'll get a call, we'll talk it over, and I'll change my mind. So don't think for a moment that we're that discipline, we're that lockstep. I said, Do you have any of those uh, truth to power that were really a, um, did, do you remember when people came and said to you as officer, I don't think this is, this is right? Yeah, one guy said, I'm not going to vote against you. I think you're making a mistake because you don't know our, our industry. I said, well, that's true. I'm, I said, uh, I don't know anything about public accounting, but I do know about management and leadership and organization and change. And that's what I assume this is all about. That seemed to satisfy him. That was when you were a civilian, not when you were an officer, right? Oh, that's what I was saying, yeah. So which job you choose? You you choose the accounting firm. So I went to uh, Chicago. They offered me like to be a partner, partner status, which in those firms is big, because you're either a partner or you're a slave. Yeah, it's a really a elitist. Law firms are the same way. You're either a, mm -hmm. or you're making decisions. So they offer me this partnership status. They even offer me a sign-on bonus for like a baseball player. So I, uh, in fact, the CEO out there, his wife, went around with Molly for two weeks. We found a condo down on uh, North North Point, right down by the water. It's a nice place in Chicago, isn't it? Molly fell in love with Chicago. It was a beautiful place. I walked to work. The hours were shorter than what I was used to working. But it was not easy. I used to have these 6 o'clock to 7.30 meetings because the big guys of the people making decisions, all the managing partners, they didn't want to lose any client time. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, we'll go from 6 to 7.30. 7.30, you're doing your job. Well, hell, half of them showed up at 7.00. If I was showing up at quarter after and so not military time, no discipline. I just went along with. It. I said, okay, you know, we just whoever was there, we made decisions. How long were you with the firm? Four and a half years. I told them if I do my job effectively, in four and a half years, you're going to want me to leave. I'm going to make a lot of decisions that some of you are going to like and some of you are going to hate, but they're going to be decisions. And uh, that's about right. He threw me a nice party, gave me a nice farewell. I told him from the podium, after experiencing four and a half years in the corporate world, in 36 years in the Army, I'm glad it was that ratio because I couldn't <laughs> handle the other. And they all kind of laughed. They treated me very nicely, polite. And then did you come back to Monterey? And I came to Monterey. Full time. Full time. Molly used to come and visit. Mm -hmm. I would come home on long weekends. Was the house, uh, I mean, you owned the house. Was it rented or you just you keep it as... We uh, kept, Molly lived here. Uh -huh. We 
kept both cars here. And when she would fly to Chicago, we'd take taxi cabs. So when did you officially retire full time? What year? I guess 94. 94. Because that's about the time I met you. Yeah, that's when... We had closed the Fort Ord, and I was getting to know, and you were a very close friend of General Jim Moore. How did you two meet? Was it here, or did you know him? Oh, we knew each other in the Pentagon. Pentagon? Yeah, we knew, we knew each other a lot. So who got who involved? You get him involved in the BRAC and the... Fort he Ord got me involved. He got you involved. Because I think Leon Panetta appointed him to be the chair of of uh, Forge. Yeah, we, we were trying to save Fort Ord from being closed, and uh, he played a prominent, very prominent role. In fact, he was the speaker when we all appeared before the BRAC Commission. Of, uh, of, I, I was a state legislator, and we had the local legislators here, and Leon was a congressman. I actually, known to no one, lobbied for you. I brought Colin Powell out here for that inspection. I said, you got to close this place. And uh, he said, yeah, sure is nice and ranges everything. Why would you want to close this place, John? You know? He said, because they told me to. I said, well, is there any, can you go back up and argue? He said, I'll try. He said, I think these are all done deals. So he did come back to me and say, I went upstairs and I talked to some people. And there was nobody listening. Ford or didn't have any friends in the Pentagon. No one understood Ford Ord. No one understood DLI. No one understands the Navy Postgraduate School. Only when we brought them out here, Sam, did they get it. I realized what precious gems. And the other thing we were, we were fighting is when I was the chief of staff of Forcecom, I was the one that made the decision to send the um, 7th Division to go get Noriega. The rest of the generals wanted to send the 82nd Airborne. And I made this impassionate plea. I said, this is ideal for the 7th Division. And the 7th Division had become the Light Fighting Brigade. They'd become uh, light, light a helicopter. Fight. And, yeah. And this is an ideal mission for a Light Fighter Division. I said, you always use the letter first. If you don't use the 7th Division, why the hell are they out there? And they said, that's a good point. So they had a big huddle. They decided to send the 7th Division. I never knew that you had a major role in that because that was, that was the, the biggest deployment we've ever had out of Monterey. I mean, those... Uh those planes transporting all the troops landed in Monterey and took off for Panama. Some had to go to Travis. And that was kind of the hard part. Because some had troops had to be trucked to Travis. Lewis had a heads up because they had McCord. They had McCord Airfield right there to deploy that division, and we didn't have a we didn't have a cord. Every time we tried to expand the airport, Frishy, so we could ha handle big planes, mm -hmm. Marina vetoed it because of those vetoes. Jim Moore tried three times. So Marina was opposed to expanding them the army airport and that would have well the runway we could have expanded it because there was a lot of space out there yeah there was space they just didn't want the 
they annoy us. And I think if we had had the runway to handle 141s and 131s, we would have had a big argument why to stay open. But with McCord up there, just opening up a gate, and there you are at the airfield. The irony of that BRAC uh, was that to close Fort Ord and move the 7th to uh, Fort Lewis. But they never, after they closed Fort Ord, they, what, they decommissioned the 7th. They just didn't. Or what did what what exactly? I, I, no, they decommissioned the uh, ninth. The seventh is still in existence. But that windfall didn't appear in Fort Lewis because I said with Norm Dixon, he said we were all excited, we were building things and investing money in Fort Dixon. Nobody showed up. Fort Dix? Excuse me, yeah, Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis. We sent two brigades up there. Well, somewhere along the way, I think they got. Diverted, but I maybe not. I don't know, but uh, I just know they didn't get what they expected. To get. That was the long and short of all that. Well, let's just talk a little bit about uh, these last few years here. I mean, you've really you just seized this community so beautifully. How how did you? Um, I mean, here you were you were not a total stranger. You were stationed here uh, in your first assignment in the in the fifties. You were. Um, married and had a house and had kids and what got you also excited about getting involved in this community because you made the big difference you're the one that came in here and discovered all the veterans organizations and all the retirees and well the blue ribbon committee as it was called was having its last meeting and I think it was Sam Downing who said, the shame we have to break up, we're just getting to know each other, which was true. Mm -hmm. you know, Sam Downing is the CEO of the of, uh, Slings Valley. Valley Hospital. And, and Jay Hudson at that time, they never talked. Pebble Beach never talked to anybody. Dog Agricultural did oh, their thing. And uh, Bob Sageman, wise old man, wonderful man, I know you know him. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you don't have to break up. He said, you can jettison the people who are not important going forward because we had some representatives from Hollister and Watsonville. This was the Blue Ribbon Committee to try to keep Fort Ord open. And so after the, the Pentagon had made the decision that it was going to bracket, downsize it. And, uh, but you must have taken a real liking to that, because I think you, more than anybody moving into this peninsula, just has seized every, I mean, within a short period of time, you were the go-to guy on everything. Well, we decided to form a 501c3 right there on the spot. Bob Sageman said, I can get all the papers that were drawn up, and uh, who wants to be part of the 501c3? Oh, Jim Moore raised his hand, I raised my hand, Sam Downing, Bob Sageman, and, and Mark Fravonich. Pebble Beach, Corporation. Pebble Beach. And, and, and there was about 12. And uh, so we said, okay, we're, we're going to stay, we're going to meet quarterly because uh, there is a mission to be accomplished here. And that is now that we don't have Solace B. Hayes, what do we do for the veterans for health care? That has to be resolved. Well, I remember meeting you because what we had had, it was like nobody in Washington Pentagon ever thought and even thought about this. 
they, de you know, this is decommissioning uh, the hospital the fort. That hospital had served for the entire retiree community here. Many of those retirees were spouses of retirees, so they were women, elderly women, who all their life had gotten their medical care through military uh, clinics and hospitals. And all of a sudden they're told, you can't do that anymore. You've got to take Medicare and go out and find a Medicare doctor. I mean, they, didn't, they couldn't they, find they him. couldn't find him. Uh, we had uh, soldiers here with their families. Uh, they had no uh, pedi pediatric uh, uh, doctors here for them who would take uh, the TRICARE insurance. I mean, you were, we were faced with a huge crisis where the active duty personnel coming for service in DLI and the Naval Postgraduate School, they had to care for themselves as they wore a uniform, but their, their, their wives and their children or their spouse and their children didn't have it. And it was a real debacle. And so not only was the active community at risk, but the retiree community was also at risk. So that's when we... Uh, General Moore and I said, why don't we get Mr. Goff to come down and offer him a troop clinic? And Jim said, Devardi is the, is the newest one. That's the one we should offer him. Long story short, Mr. Goff came down reluctantly because he didn't believe the people here, would go to an outpatient clinic, they would come to Palo Alto. But we uh, made a deal where uh, Jim and I, Jim, Jim Moore and I, cast a lot of blue chips in with friends in the Pentagon. And we said to Mr. Goff, we'll give you this place free. The Army will transfer this to the VA. Never been done before. If you'll agree to put $100,000 into it, fix it up, get a pharmacy, start taking care of the people. And so opened the Veterans Clinic, and one of the most successful things we've ever done in the community. Yeah, that's how it all happened. Suddenly, one prescription is went to two, and the dilemma for the retirees, a little spouse, they could get their medicine there. Connie Brown and two nurses, two doctors. Now there's Connie Brown and eight nurses, nine doctors. All function out there. And it's grown, it's busting, and it seems, and with your good initiative telling us we ought to build a new clinic and provide a joint services for the active duty and retiree community and veterans community, bring in private sector doctors to uh, rent office space. We're going to build this clinic. It's become a, <laughs> you know, I guess if anything, this is where you got that nickname around my wife, my wife and, and I and a lot of others who know you, we call you Generalissimo because you were just able to get get things done and have a big vision picture of, hey, we can, we can do this, but we can even do it better than it's ever been done before. Well, when I saw that the VA had the money and the Army had the land, the Army needed expansion, but they didn't have a place to expand. I got Lisa and, and Colonel Mars together and said, talked it over. I said, why not? Nobody's ever done it before. So I mean, we can't do it. And we need, we need the space. It'll be unique. We'll have civilian doctors treating, try, treating active duty families instead of on Cass Street yeah. out there where they live. Yeah. And they can afford the real estate because it's free land so we don't have to charge them the highest rent in order to get a uh, you know, return on the investment. And yeah. So that's what's going to happen. The, the Army has signed a memorandum with the VA 
saying we want these seven acres across the street from Burger King, and we're moving forward. Tell us a couple of other things you've done. You've done that, and that's now underway. We've got to get the funding. It's going to be a fight in Congress, but I'm dedicated to doing it. And But you also found that this retiree community uh, didn't have, you know, just didn't have your, your own personnel training and keeping them up and informed on what's happening to your benefits. And, there's, you know, it's not just a benefit. It's, all, it's complicated issues. It's... Uh, Retirement pay, it's Social Security, it's uh, investments in 401k, it's access to veterans' health care uh, or Medicare. Very complicated. Uh, and insurance and death benefits and everything. that. And you put together this, talk a little bit about how you saw the need to do that. Well, we had the retiree council, which was very inactive. So I decided to be the chair of it. Told people we're going to start getting things done. Invite people to join. Now we have about 38 people who come every first Monday of the month. Colonel Martis attends. PX guy is there. The commissary guy is there. And they get told what's going on. And then once a year we have what we had yesterday. Retiree Appreciation Day, where now we started with 300 people used to come to it. Now we have 800. And after yesterday, 800 people know a hell of a lot more now than they did, they threw it did on Friday. Well, less than 10 years, look what you've done. You've put this together, to re organize the retiree community and keep them with an annual conference on updating them on all the issues relating to their lives. You've created the uh, Veterans Clinic, which is moving into a community-based uh, Department of Defense and Veterans Department of Veterans Affairs joint uh, clinic. You've, we've gotten us back on track on Fort Ord, finally, on the military um, veteran cemetery. It's, it's, we've thought outside the box on that one. Um, and still, it's, we, I think it's going to work. Uh, more health you've talked about and creating this uh, long-term care community, living community, retiree community. Uh, certainly been involved as chair of my committee to interview prospective uh, high school Cat students Cat who Cat want to go to the academies. And we just had, uh, we really missed you the other night. Uh, Colonel Martis did a wonderful job, and, and there were about 100 people there. I mean, it's, this thing is growing. Yeah, the whole thing is mushroomed. You've just, and how, uh, I mean, in 10 years, you know, a lot of people retire here, but you, you, you decided to just keep staying involved. Well, I also spent, uh, Carol Snow called me up. Oh. Somebody called me up and said the VA was in deep trouble. Fizzy Nurse Association. So Mary Adams, uh -huh. myself, and one other person. Head of the chamber, of, of head of the... Uh... Alzheimer's. Uh, anyway, we did a search, found Carol Snow, Great woman, great leader, brought, brought her in. I chaired that board for six years. They were losing money when we started. When we left six years later, they were making a couple hundred thousand a month, which in that business is good. Yeah, fantastic. So... I guess um, every time you have an idea, I said, Molly, she said, you have too many ideas. <laughs> every time you have an idea, you either forget it or walk it. So I've, I've been very engaged, but there was an article in the Senior Plus magazine on me. Have my ten golden rules. 
And they said, what do you get out of all this? And I said, I have met some of the finest people I've ever known doing all these things. And that's my reward. Well, you've left the community a lot better than you found it, too. This is, I think you probably left the military, the Pentagon, the Army in better shape than you found it. That's funny because that's my 10th golden rule. I want to show you the 10 golden rules because you hit it right on the head. That's if everybody would make what they found better, what a wonderful world it would be. You know, I kind of, uh, my dad taught me that about when I was first camping. And I think I, maybe I was in Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts. I was before Boy Scouts. I remember the first time we went camping. You know, he always said, you got to leave this place better than you find it. So put all the sticks back, make it all look, look, make the forest look more forest than it was when you came. And it's, it's, uh, it's a very great principle in life. It's a great principle out every day. Almost sort of walking into a room and walking out, even walking into a meeting and walking out. Have it, have it end better than it started. Yeah, I think my 10th gold rule says, because it's military, I said, leave the army a better place for your subordinates than when you found it. Well, you've done that for the peninsula. Let me let me go back, and I wanted to, I want to end a, a minute uh, talking a bit about your family. But I want to. I remember a story you told me uh, in the hospital last week, and I thought, um, and you'd like to tell it again. Is the the time you went to uh, uh, with a detail to talk to Mrs. Abrams about oh. naming a tank after her husband, General? Abrams. This is a great story that's probably never been told. Yeah, so I, I knew General Abrams, so they put me on a committee to go to her house to talk to Mrs. Abrams about the tank. And I guess there was about 10 of us. We had answers for everything, charts, everything. And so we got there. We gave her this big briefing. She's, She's a pretty, pretty old now, right? Uh, She's, he's passed away. And yeah, he had passed away. She was a pretty crusty lady, too. She had John Abrams, who retired a couple of years ago as a four-star. She had him when he was the CG of, of the 3rd Armored Division in Frankfurt. Anyway... We gave her all this briefing, and she said... So we, the briefing was that tank you, had look, get, you had to get her permission to use her husband's name? Yeah. Yeah, we had to get her permission. And you just can't name something like that after somebody without their permission. Because they, they could sue you or whatever. Mm -hmm. So she said, well, I, I, I think it's a wonderful idea. I just have one question. She said, is it a good tank? <laughs> <laughs> is it a good tank? Is it a good tank? She said, I wouldn't want it named after it if it wasn't a good tank. Uh, and I said, yes, Mr. Abrams, it's a, a very, very good tank. She said, well, then, okay, go ahead. Uh, Cute ending to an interview, perhaps. Well, it's uh, it's it's wonderful. This has been a story about your life, mostly your military life. But you can't just talk about military. You got to talk about uh, family and and um, you now have you've 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 raised four children and have what fifty? How many grandchildren? Nine. Nine grandchildren. You're so proud of those kids. They're the heart and soul of my family. Well, they're going to carry on. There's no doubt about it. Tell me about your... Uh, you You always advise people about your rules. The, I call them the Generalissimo's rules. Well, 
They're pretty simple. I call this 10 golden rules. It's like 36 years of hindsight. Mm -hmm. Well, what I thought led me to be successful. Be professionally competent. What the hell are you doing? Integrity is everything. Don't be comfortable with second place. Well, that's very good. A lot of people get red ribbons, you know, and oh boy, it's second place. Don't be comfortable with second place. Try harder. Like in the DMZ, second place is no good. Yeah. Be faithful to your subordinates. Take care of your troops. A sense of humor is critical for long-range success. You have to be to laugh, find some outlet. Otherwise, in the long term, you'll fizzle out. Do you have any remembers of a, of a particularly funny thing that happened in the military? Or your... In your life, you're talking about the uh, in Vietnam the uh, pranks are sort of the Aussies, the uh, Australians are. Oh yeah. No, I think. Uh, but you kept a sense of humor. Kept a sense of humor, and I guess the Pentagon is the hardest place to keep your sense of humor because the hours are so long. Bureaucracy to get something done seems endless. So many people have to agree. And all you need is one naysayer, and the whole thing stops. Sounds like Congress. Hey, you haven't even gotten to Congress yet. <laughs> but, uh, Six is loyalty to your your mission, your family, and yourself is paramount. Trust your seventh is trust your professional instincts. At this stage of the game, if two computer runs say go right. And your gut says go left, go left. Yeah, I use that a lot in politics. Follow your gut. Follow your gut. This stage of the game, you know a lot more than you think you know. And eight is, I found this to be so, so much of a problem in the Pentagon. Not with my people, but I, I go to meetings and people weren't ready. So I said, always be prepared. If you're going to go to a meeting, know what the hell you're doing. Interesting, the similarity of that between the Boy Scout model to be prepared. And, it, you know, it, people don't think about it, but... If, if if people all people in the room are prepared, then it's a waste of time. Yeah, because those are prepared or will are wanting to make a decision to move on and move up. Yeah, and those who aren't prepared can't make it. They have to take it back to somebody, and they can't make a decision. Yeah, and nothing gets done. Yeah. Now nine is probably the hardest one of all. It's, and I learned how, I worked hard at doing this. I talk a lot. But my ninth one is be an excellent listener. If you go to a meeting and really listen, then at the end of the meeting, you can say something pretty 
important or feel comfortable with the decision or object to the decision for these reasons. But you can't do that if you don't listen. A lot of people daydream. I they, found it's even in your personal relationships. Jerry, <laughs> sometimes, because I think men want to fix things. So, you know, what's broken, I'll fix it. And it was fun time. She said, just sit down and listen. I want you to just listen. And it really was quite a lesson to me because I find that there's great value in being a listener. And people do want to... And it's an art. ...hear the story. It's an art. I think it's the hardest art there is. Because everybody wants to tell what they know. Mm -hmm. And few people care what the other guy thinks. Well, I tell you, I, I listened to many a meeting at the end, stood up, blew the whole decision apart because he had forgotten three big things or I left feeling good. If I had been listening, I wouldn't have known. And then the tenth one is the one I said, make a better army, a better core for your subordinates to inherit. That's quite a big one. Uh, the uh, make a better army, is your, you're saying this is advice to one person. It seems to me that um, you became a major general because you could do that. As a single person, you made a better army and a corps. And I think you've also done that with our community. I mean, you're, in my opinion, one of the great persons that I've ever known, and I really appreciate you having this time to record this and put it on tape. Well, I hope the taping came out okay. Sorry I scratched my nose a couple of times. <laughs> Is there anything you want to say, a last thing, anything about anything? Yeah, I think I'd like to say that the people who live here in this peninsula take an awful lot every day for granted. That you are living in a special place in the world and you have the best hospitals here. You have the best of everything here. I just wish more people would wake up every morning and say, man, I'm really lucky to be here. Because a lot of people just assume everything. This lucky point. to be here by giving something back. Is that what you're asking to give? Put something into it. Yeah. Make it better than you found it. Make it better than you found it. And there's so many people who I work with. That's what they do. Doctor Elliot Light. He's about the poorest doctors in the county. He's a general practitioner. He takes Medicare, Medi-Cal. He takes all the low-paying stuff. But he does it because he wants to heal people, help people. And uh, he's made this place a better community by virtue of what he does every day. Enjoy what you have. Appreciate what you have. Please don't ever take freedom granted. Freedom is fought for every day by an awful lot of brave people who you don't know, they don't know you, but they're putting their lives on their limb every day to make sure you can do what you want every day. Thank you, General. It was a beautiful, beautiful interview. Thank you.